Citizen Talks is a podcast series brought to you by TRT World Citizen, featuring discussions with humanitarians and activists, artists, and changemakers, exploring the global humanitarian issues that shape our society and the world at large. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Citizen Talks from TRT World Citizen. I am your host, Min Kailu, and today we are very, very happy to be joined by Omar Salha. Uh, Omar Salha is a PhD Nuhud scholar at SOAS University of London, specializing in the study of the integration of Muslims in British society. He is the founder and director of the Ramadan Tent Project, uh, and he has consulted and worked with NGOs, civic organizations, uh, and international governments in the areas of interfaith dialogue, uh, community cohesion, and public diplomacy. So we're very, very uh, happy that you could join us today, Omar. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for, thank you for having me. really appreciate it. It's uh, great to be here in Istanbul with you guys and looking forward to this conversation. I was actually also really excited to talk to you about this because, you know, a lot of times uh, we are having discussions about, you know, very sort of large global humanitarian crises uh, and the nature of these kinds of things, migration and war, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, when you're talking about humanitarianism and human rights, you know, when you, when you move down to the sort of social level uh, in communities and societies, there's a lot of, of nuance, you know, that gets skipped over when you're talking about a crisis and you're just, you know, trying to take care of an emergency situation. Um, so I think this is something that you're probably a specialist in. Um, so I'm really excited to, to get into these issues. But, but first things first, uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the Ramadan Tent Project, which is, sure. you know, a uh, big thing in the UK, has been done internationally, um, and it's been a, a great success from all I've heard about it. Uh, it's a social enterprise that you founded in 2013, if I'm correct. Yep. Uh, so for our listeners who may not be familiar with uh, the project, can you give us a brief overview of what the Ramadan Tent Project is? Sure. So Ramadan Tent Project is a British charity uh, based in London with a mission of bringing communities together to better understand each other. Um, we do this through the annual Ramadan Festival, which is curated and produced annually um, with a mission of uh, turning strangers into friends, raising awareness around the month of Ramadan, Muslims and Islam uh, in Britain as well as an opportunity to build bridges between different members of the community, that whether that be within the Muslim community itself or also outside of that. So people of uh, other faiths and none uh, to learn more about the month of Ramadan and why it is the holiest month in the Islamic calendar. And uh, part of the festival, we have the flagship initiative, which is Open Iftar, which invites people of all faiths and none to come together for a free meal during iftar at some of Britain's most iconic and loved uh, locations and landmarks. And so we've been going now uh, for 10 years. This year we celebrated our 10 year anniversary and uh, it's been growing from strength to strength. And it's great to see the amazing re response. And also, you know, for us, it's a, a privilege and honor to be hosting over half a million people since the inception of this charity. Uh, which celebrates really Islamic culture, heritage, and of course, um, the beautiful faith uh, that many Muslims uh, share and obviously observe during the month of Ramadan. So uh, you touched on it a bit, um, you know, uh, about community cohesion and, you know, getting people familiar with uh, Islam and, you know, Ramadan, etc. But when you sort of conceived of this project, you know, what, what was your like long-term vision, you know, what did you hope uh, to achieve with this initiative in British society? So actually the first idea, we have to go back to 2011. So a couple of years before the first Open of Tar event. And for those who are listening in and watching in will know, 2011 in London, we had the uh, Tottenham riots or the London riots. Okay which started in North London and then escalated and, and sort of grew and grew across the capital, but then across the UK. Um, so across the England and across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. And it, a lot of it was, the catalyst behind this was a young person who was shot uh, dead. And um, the youth reacted um, out of frustration and you know, you will see a tendency where these movements, especially we are seeing now in France, for instance, where a young, innocent teenager was shot dead by police. 
Right. Um, we've seen the riots that are taking place, but of course, those who are going above and beyond and maybe taking advantage of the riots here of looting, etc. So mm. effectively, we need to go back to the issue at hand, which was similar to, to Paris today, what happened in London in 20, 2011 with the Tottenham riots, um, a lot of public funding cuts that took place. Um, clearly, an innocent life was lost. Um, but also, in particularly, this was during the month of Ramadan as well. Mm. So as a young British Muslim living at a time where young people are out in the streets doing things they shouldn't be doing, breaking the law, um, you know, how can we respond? How can we ensure that, you know, actually Ramadan teaches us to be the best of version of ourselves? How can we go out uh, into the streets and actually try and sort of divert attention away from the violence that was taking place? And so this was actually one of the main catalysts that, that, that you know, brought us to where we are today is how can we, you know, go out to the open? And, and we did. We, there were a few evenings where in 2011, in the summer of 2011, where Ramadan, you know, much, much longer hours in terms of the fast. No. Uh, we would go out, welcome the homeless um, and invite people to come and bring food and almost have a flash mob iftar type of thing where we would, you know, give out iftar meals and actually... Do dances. Well, <laughs> not, not exactly, but um, try and get uh, sort of as many people of different ages to come together and just really just, you know, uh, come out and do something positive. And, yeah. and I, I, be, a, be an outlet for young people as well to be part of and involved in. Um, so that was, that was one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is... Uh, you know, in Ramadan, growing up in Britain, th there isn't really a, a space or, a th you know, a third space, I like to call it, where you can meet different people. You know, people who are not fasting, for instance, to mm. learn more about your faith. Um, usually Ramadan is spent in your, ho your home or, you know, you're inviting people over or family, friends, or you're going to the mosque or a community center. But, you know, something which actually makes me feel that Ramadan actually is here and is in the public, is in the public domain and is open. It's not something that, you know, I need to sort of, you know, do and observe in secret. Mm. You know, it's, Ramadan should not be a month where I have to sort of kindly decline that offer for tea or coffee at work uh, without offending the other because uh, I'm fasting. And, but I don't want to tell them I'm fasting. And if I tell them I'm fasting, then maybe they think, you know, you're weird. Yeah. You know, what, what a weird thing to do. Fasting for 30 days with no food and drink. Yeah. And then suddenly you're out of that sort of, social bubble you're not part of those meetings you're not you don't get invited to social so, you know sort of networks for work and so it, it it made me feel or part of me at least not uh genuine or, or authentic with how i wanted to uh, express myself let's say with the month of ramadan and, and that obviously connects uh, as a muslim mm. growing up in, in britain so you know, there'll be many, many stories where people are sort of, you know, secretly popping out of the office to go and pray and come back because there's no prayer room. Um, there is no halal meats option in the canteen, for instance, or the cafeteria. And so therefore you just have to opt for veggie every single day uh, or bring something in. Um, these small little things uh, that uh, play quite a big part or big role in, in, in our sort of uh, sense of belonging, let's say, that we actually feel that you know, we are acknowledged and we are valued and, and sort of uh, our faith is not seen as almost a taboo, but on the contrary, it's celebrated. And so Britain 10, 15 years ago is a lot, lot different to where it is today. And I can, you know, right. easily say that probably Britain is one of, if not the most accommodating in terms of diversity, inclusion and equality. There's still a lot to do for sure. Mm. Um, but I think those were sort of the, the main drivers for me. Um, before the charity was founded in 2013. And then we, we started our first campaign in 2013 where every single day of Ramadan on university campus, we invite people together for free, uh, free food. You know, that's, that's yeah, always going right. to be a great uh, a pull, pull factor, right? No. And so uh, with that in mind, we had hundreds turning up every single day and some returning faces, some new faces and the word spread through, you know, word of mouth, family, friends and, you know, local residents, the homeless, you know, everyone was welcome. And I think that was the starting point of something really special. I think that's when we knew really that 
there's something cool about this gathering. Yeah. And, and we didn't want to box it so soon and say, this is what it is. We allowed it to organically grow. And I think that's, that's the, the important lesson. And looking back, I think, you know, now look, celebrating our first decade is this has all been an organic journey. Yeah. Do you think it was that sort of spirit that, you know, because the project has been very successful. Yeah, you know, um, as you said, you've engaged hundreds of thousands of people, uh, been hosted in multiple countries, iconic cultural uh, landmarks in the UK, uh, Wembley Stadium, Trafalgar Square. You know, uh, what is it that you think that really drew people to it? You know, that gave it that appeal to not only the Muslim community, but the general non-Muslim population? Was it just that spirit of togetherness, that spirit of, you know? Well, I... It's, it's something different, you know, stumbling across hundreds of hundreds of people in a public square or, or park where you, people are gathered and sat on the ground, by the way. Mm. So, you know, and, and there is a reason, there is a sort of a deliberate science to that in, in that we want to reflect the tr 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 tradition in yeah. Islam. And, you know, you look, you go to Muslim majority countries, for instance, and for iftar, people are sat outside mosques, court courtyards and, and gardens and, and streets and, and sat on the ground and welcoming people. And whether you're a traveler or passerby, you're, you're part of that uh, gathering now. You're part, you know, we see you. You, you, you come and sit with us and, and, and you're, you're offered this meal. And I think that is the beauty of, you know, what's inspired by the Sharq, if I can say, and I use that word loosely. So the East. Um, and I, and, I, and I include, you know, the African continent. I include uh, East Europe into that, uh, the Middle East, uh, Asia, um, as well into that sort of bracket where, you know, the sort of non-Europe, non-US non, non um, geographical areas where this culture of welcoming others around food, um, uh, especially in Ramadan, mm. uh, is something which we're very accustomed to, we're very familiar with. But then now sort of export this into cities like Paris, Madrid, Berlin and London, uh, it's unheard of. Mm. You know, we, not, we have not really seen anything like this. And so I think that's the, the first thing is people are attracted to the fact that something is happening here. There, there, there is a, a spirit, for sure, as you say. And Ramadan is a great way where it's a month of charity, a month of spiritual sustenance. People come together uh, and feel inspired by themselves, feel more wholesome about themselves and about, about their identity and their relationship with God. Um, and I think, you know, with that in mind, uh, every single year, ensuring that spirit of togetherness and community where everyone is welcome, irrespective of your faith. Um, and, and it had to be that way. It could not be any other way. It, it had to be done in a way where everyone, and I mean everyone, is welcome. Even people who disagree with you, everyone is welcome. Because that is the spirit of what Ramadan is about and what you know, our message is. Uh, is. is a message of submission, really. And, and that's, that's an open call for everyone mm. uh, who, wants to, who wants to take that call and, and sort of um, live, that, live that life um, and live that sort of uh, philosophy of life. Um, and I think, you know, we deliberately look at places like Chelsea Football Club, you know, Stamford Bridge, Royal Albert Hall, um, Westminster Abbey, for instance, and the British Library and Trafalgar Square. I mean, these are places where in their history, nothing like an open of Tara was ever organized. Mm. So for me, the, the question was going back to those, those early years that inspired me and really gave me, gave me that catalyst was, if we are to sort of really show that Ramadan is here, and Ramadan is here for everyone, and Ramadan should be celebrated in the public domain, then we need to be in spaces where we can get to everyone, and not just only in our homes, mosques, and, cent and community centers. Right. So let's bring Ramadan out, and, and, and doing that with a, uh, a method which, again, going back to the roots of the spirit, is it's open to everyone. And I think that pulls together a larger audience which is unfamiliar with Ramadan as well as bringing Muslims into spaces where they also feel a sense of belonging. Yeah. If you love music, you'll be familiar with Royal Albert Hall. If you love football, you'll be familiar with Wembley Stadium. And I do not think they are mutually exclusive of one another as part of your identity. Your identity is a makeup of your faith and your hobbies and your interests and your languages and culture. And I think that sort of, uh, if I can say, uh, portable migration 
uh, chip that we carry with us, all of us, uh, is ever evolving. And I think it's really important to celebrate all of that and everything about you because that's what true belonging is, is celebrating every, every part of you. How would you characterize today the non-Muslim British uh, attitude towards British Muslims and you know Muslims in general? Like, what is the, What's the perspective of Islam in popular culture uh, in the UK? So, there's, so I've been guilty of this, and I just want to make a point on this. Uh -huh. the, the, the term non-Muslim, I really hate. Okay. Let's, 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 let's pick another one right now that we can use. For so so, so you, you may have noticed I've said, I've said other faiths or none. Okay. Yeah, I mean, looking at this cultural shift, I mean, you have to only look at um, some of the research that was conducted uh, in about 20, almost 10 to 13 years ago. Um, and, uh, and the research actually recently uh, done um, earlier this year uh, by, by Hyphen, um, which was commissioned uh, just before Ramadan, um, looking at the role of G Generation Z um, and how they view their Islam in today's world. And what we're seeing is Islam amongst younger people, particularly amongst Muslims, is very, very important and a lot more religious than, let's say, their other non-Muslim peers. Really? Yeah. Um, so that is a, a sort of a starting point here for us, is that we're seeing a lot, a lot more younger people um, and actually, actually seeing over 50% who pray at least five times a day or regularly. Interesting. So that, that is a very clear distinction when compared to other faiths where you're, you're looking at sort of approximately over 70% have not been to a place of worship. So that is a very interesting uh, um, uh, piece of work there. And that's actually backed up by uh, some of the research conducted um, this year on uh, the level of religiosity in, in Britain. So for the first time in Britain, uh, Christians are not the majority faith group in Britain. Mm. And what we are seeing is the majority faith group, quote unquote to say, is actually people of um, non-faith. Non so we're seeing atheism, now, so, so we're seeing so to speak. Agnostic, agnostic, yeah, agnostic, yeah, yes. agnosticism or atheism. No. And we're seeing now actually, you know, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Sikhs, Buddhists, and so on and so forth, and I'll make up the minority in total. Mm. Um, so that shift uh, indicates that, along with the research conducted with, with young people, is that there is now a shift towards uh, more, um, a growing number of people feeling apathetic when it comes to faith or when it comes to religion. So there's a challenge here across all faiths, really, in terms of what do they do in terms of uh, how faith plays in a, an integral role part of your identity if the research suggests that actually your identity now is you know not as uh, well, religion or faith is not as, a, as an important or, or high factor as part of your identity as it was let's say 10 15 years ago 20 years ago and so we're, we're seeing a shift in that change there um, elsewhere where we, we I mean we've seen uh, research which suggests that actually two thirds of of UK adults who are not part of uh, of, of the Islamic faith see actually as Islam as incompatible with British values, and this is quite you know astonishing to see this when mm. actually over eighty percent of Muslims in Britain feel there is a sense of belonging in Britain. Mm. So, on one hand, you've got the majority, the overwhelming majority of M British Muslims feel they have a strong sense of belonging to Britain. Yeah. But then you've got the majority of UK adults who view Islam as incompatible with British values. Yeah. So the first question is, what is the definition of Britain? British values. Or British values, yeah. precisely, to those two distinctive groups. Um, Do you think they're seeing them the same? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and, and again, this is because you've got you know, so, so it's interesting because there's, there's an issue of race and culture. So often when we talk about British culture and British race, they're two distinctive conversations. When we talk about British culture, um, are we talking about the, uh, you know, the uh, role of the monarchy? The, are we talking about um, the uh, importance of previous prime ministers and their work in British public life? 
for instance? Uh, are we talking about British fashion, British um, music, British media? Um, and British race, then you start to look at, okay, what is Britishness? And what is race? And particularly in a country in Britain, uh, where, again, even though the majority of Brits in Britain are white, um, one in 10 white Brits feel they are a minority. Really? Yeah. So mm. it, it is, it's really interesting to see that there is a, uh, if you feel almost like there's a spectrum here um, of looking at uh, the issue of, let's say, culture vis-a-vis -vis race, um, what we're seeing is there is a very fringe minority here which focuses on one's whiteness as their a definition of Britishness, right. which is a fringe minority. But the large majority in that spectrum is looking at British culture uh, as incompatible with Islam because they view Islam as this uh, extremist ideology um, where young people feel that they have a bigger uh, resonant factor towards um, extremist fighters, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. So this rhetoric here exists. Right. There clearly is a gap. And for me, this is a communication gap. This is a gap where for sure there is, um, you know, there is institutional racism. There is uh, propaganda. There is Islamophobia. Like there is uh, anti-Semitism. There is, um, you, you know, uh, uh, racism and discrimination a, a con a, a against uh, black people um, uh, in the UK and, and elsewhere. They have all of these issues here at hand. But ultimately, I think this, those two sort of uh, figures that I mentioned earlier clearly indicate that there's something not quite right here. We're getting t very two opposing uh, sets of data. Yeah. Um, and then perhaps actually, if we were able to look at building bridges between, between those two sets of communities, I mean, data, collecting data is great when you're looking at you know, uh, you know, two sets of groups and collecting data from, from each of those. But... Yeah. The next step is, okay, well, well now what? Well, what yeah. do we do with this? And I think if we can build a strategy and a policy where we're able to actually bring those communities together to mix with each other, and then actually whatever phobia they may have can be, you know, yeah. uh, uh, you know uh, sort of any misconceptions they may have is then per, per correct um, through these uh, gatherings and meetings. Yeah. The open iftar effectively is, is, is a model of that. My worry when it comes to that in particular is that, you know, that simply by questioning any particular narratives, a lot of these new narratives that are that are emerging, you know, and saying, well, you know, we have a different perspective that the Muslim community can very easily alienate itself from the broader society in many countries. Right. And uh, certainly in the UK, certainly in America. And, and I think we've seen this happening in the recent past where. You know, they say, well, we believe certain things when we feel this way and we like to raise our kids in this particular way and we try to avoid X, Y, Z. And then it automatically becomes a condemnation of that community, the Muslim community saying you're, you know, you're holding these antiquated, oppressive ideologies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I, how, how do you sort of how do you navigate these conversations, the very difficult conversations, as you say, without without alienating an entire community, but still saying firmly, like, we, we believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have to judge anyone because that's not our right but this is what we believe and this is who we are mm. you know well i mean I'll, I'll bring it back to a, a story where let's say we have a, a muslim player a muslim football player mm. playing at an elite level in the premier league and is fasting ramadan mm. his coach says you can't fast during ramadan because it'll impact you on your on your performance levels and uh, if you fa if you fast ramadan then you know you're going to be omitted from the team you're not going to mm -hmm. play for the team and this is the, the, the you know this is his, his job right you know he, he loves doing uh, playing for his team he loves you know it's not only a hobby but it's, it's a job a passion of his and so um you know th behind the scenes there is obviously a, a battle ongoing off the off the off the pitch uh, in terms of like re-education and education and actually trying to meet him at the ground like listen this means a lot to me can i can i still fast and play um and, and this could be easily be like sort of, well, this is wrong. You need to do it this way. And then and, and that's it. Case closed and you know, end the conversation there. But what we see is actually now a lot more Muslim players are coming out and really feeling proud of the fact that, you know, I can be a Muslim and fast and play 
uh, we have the sports medicine and science scientists here in the club to support us doing that. Mm. And actually, football clubs are going above and beyond to ensure that our, our athletes who are fasting well um, uh, hydrated, have they got the right meals, um, do they need anything else from us? Perhaps do they need to make uh, know, know which is the closest mosque to them? You know, this is an active policy of, of inclusion. And this is an active policy of ensuring that we want to create a safe and best space for all of our employees, right? And similarly, as a Muslim, right, if you look at your faith and then it's down to you to, 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 to see what matters most to you, right? Uh, do, we, do you feel nostalgic about the fact that you do not hear the Adhan as you would, let's say, in Istanbul? You hear from every single direction, right? And some people have made that migration. Some people have, have left, yeah. you know, um, the, the capital cities of Europe and the West uh, to move to, to Istanbul because of that and solely because of that. And, and that's enough reason for them. It's not right or wrong. It, it, it's their personal choice, but no. it, that, that's, that's their driving factor here. That's what they, they, they want to do. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, the point I'm trying to get at is, irrespective of the challenges we may face in our daily lives, um, there is always going to be a way, a breakthrough where we have a better understanding and respect for one another. I do not think we, we, we will be turning towards more sort of um, isolationist uh, um, behavior and thinking um, because that's the easy way out. Hmm. And on the contrary, we need to be a f careful of the language we use. We either are othering or, be, you know, be, uh, you know uh, sort of tools or uh, we're using mechanisms of belonging. And so us and them is already the, a very bad starting point. Hmm. You know, there is no us and them. There's only uh, this, this unifying we. And, and that's, that's the point that we need to be looking at here is that how can we ensure that we are affording the safety of X, Y and Z? You know, like how, how can we work together to ensure that, you know, my beliefs and your beliefs are not, you know, uh, trampling on one another or we're not saying that this is right and this is wrong. Is there a safe space that we can come to in the middle here? And, and, I, and I, I believe that that is possible. We've lived on this planet for how many years? thousands of years, you know. No. So, like, I think it's important for us to remember that uh, if you look at only at the time of the Prophet, for example, you know, when he made that migration, uh, to Medina, and he was a son of the of the Quraysh, and was kicked out of his hometown, and he was told that you are a magician, you are a liar, and f have faced all these accusations, and was kicked out. You know, this is someone who there was a clear uh, a mechanism of breaking here and division, but actually, if you look at you know the ability to use his hikmah which was to respond with evil with goodness, to be a, a good uh, Samaritan, a good uh, example of what it is to be um, a servant leader, who he was. Uh, uh, that uh, sort of philosophy and, and uh, uh, style of leadership will only attract people to you. Mm. And so irrespective of how difficult the challenges are, we need to remember that we are following this, this sort of best practice. We may disagree at the end of the day, and we, we do this in our communities. We disagree several, on several things in our communities around, um, you know, whether it's theological questions uh, or whether it's political, which party did you vote for? What day are you fasting? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Which moon sighting are you following precisely? So yeah. I think all of those things, you know, put together, the, the most important thing is actually, you know what, that person made me feel like so-and-so. He made me feel valued. He, he actually did listen to me, although we disagree on these things. I can understand where he's coming from. Because that's where we are. We're coming from somewhere. We're going somewhere. And, and this is part of our growth. Good. I'm going to get in trouble because I know I'm supposed to cut it in terms of time. Um, but I did. there was one question that I wanted to They did to warn ask me you. before. They did say uh, two hours potentially. He's, gonna, <laughs> he's that guy. I'm that guy. Um, I'm just doing this for my own personal, <laughs> personal interest. I wanted to speak about the humanitarian sector specifically in relationship in relation to Muslim communities. Um, because, you know, obviously there's a, a, a great... Uh, encouragement and onus that's placed on us as 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 Muslims to uh, spiritually, you know, to act in service to the poor, to the destitute, to you know the the downtrodden, those who are in need. Um, you know, however, when you're talking about the general global humanitarian sector, um, 
you know, in many ways, I think the structure of humanitarian organizations today has been sort of created to fit within the capitalist system. Um, and subsequently, it requires, you know, a very sort of capitalist structure. You have to have your fundraising departments and you have to do advertising, right? You have to do marketing. You have to, you know, have ads on TV and, and, and be quirky and get people to be, you know, giving you money constantly. Um, there's massive operational budgets within, you know, many of these organizations, even some of the biggest global, uh, you know, humanitarian bodies. Um, so I just, from your personal experience working with the social enterprise and setting up an organization, you know, do you, do you think that this NGO, NGO structure is um, the most effective means of us as a community pooling our collective resources uh, to bring benefit to those in need? Is there something, I don't know, better that you've ever seen or envisioned that could work, you know, more effectively um, mm. without all of this you know, sort of extra stuff that's that's kind of added on when you have to institutionalize within these within these systems. Mm. B before I forget, uh, just remind yeah, me, please. just remind me that there is uh, something I want to come back to in terms of the uh, uh, Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. Okay. Um, which is connected to this uh, point. But to answer your question uh, head on, um, look, there there is a uh, a movie coming out. Or maybe maybe out already this weekend. Uh, Oppenheimer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The atom bomb. The creator of the. Yep. Atom yep, bomb. Yeah. Christopher Nolan. Latest. Yep. Uh, latest movie. Um, I hope I can understand this one. I didn't. Get the last, <laughs> I didn't get the last. <laughs> to one. be fair, I mean they say Christopher Nolan movies you need to watch them at least twice. Yeah. Or three times before you can get through the um, audio uh, and hear what actually people are saying. Uh, <laughs> probably is maybe deliberate. I'm not sure. But uh, great, great movie director and producer, sure, yeah, yeah. And great movie, great movies as well. Definitely. Um, but the reason why I mention this is how many people this weekend will go to watch that or put that as part of their plans to go and watch that. Quite a few, I imagine. Yeah. It's, his, it's his latest movie. It's the first yeah. one I think since uh, before COVID. I think Tenet right. came out. Tenet, Tenet came out in COVID. I yeah. think it was. Um, so it, it's it's you know big big major reviews and people are really excited about it. Big blockbuster movie. Um, so many people will be going down to that. Um, the reason why I mention this is, look, we live in a world where uh, we are attracted by the. Um, science of marketing and advertisements every single person on this planet is selling something right if it's not a cup of water if it's not coffee if it's not oil if it's not education healthcare, um faith everyone has a message which they are either selling as in selling for free or selling with profit in mind commercial, non-commercial, everyone is, is doing something like this. And, and this is why soft power for me is such a, 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 you know, a, a big passion for me is because it looks at how we can attract those to your you know, way of thinking through non-coercive means. So how can we attract people towards, let's say, um, uh, understanding more about Let's say we're, we're in Turkey today. So look, you're looking at Turkey as rich cultural heritage from the west to the east. And tourism is a great way of doing that. You know, tourism is, is, a, is a fundamental tool in soft power. How can we uh, use Turkey's amazing history, amazing beaches, amazing uh, culture and food to invite people to come over and, and feel attracted to Turkey? And obviously, tourism and, and Turkey's economy is, is a major, major uh, contributor. Mm -hmm. So charities today have to adapt in a world where there is incredibly uh, competing uh, you know, sectors within our economy, which is trying to drain and uh, take away your attention. And, and ba basically, you've got a number of different sectors up. Uh, bidding for your attention hmm. and where is your attention going to go Instagram yeah. Twitter Facebook Threads yeah. um, Elon Musk and his takeover of Twitter and his absurd sometimes tweets that he does and all of this is part of 
the brand, you know, and, and, and his personal brand, but also the brand of, of, uh, of you know, Twitter, for example. Mm. And, uh, and, and I go back to this because if we are to look at countries, let's say, as brands, as we do as trainers, jeans, T-shirts, etc. Yeah. Um, then we come to understand a little bit about, uh, more around how we live. If we, the moment we step out of this room, we are literally, you know, f in a room full of brands. I noticed this brand actually. I've I've seen this brand, or I've seen this TV because of the logo. I understand. I've seen this logo somewhere, or I've seen that watch. I've seen this logo somewhere. I don't mm. know the exact you know details of it, but it, 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 I reckon I res I know I recognize this, or the polo shirt. You know, like and so on and so forth. All these different brands have a story, and have uh, a, a connection to a particular um, perspective and, and value that we put to, to it. So countries in many ways are now uh, through soft power have learnt and learning to view themselves as not only as a nation state but also as a brand mm. and how we can almost sell this brand and attract people to this brand mm. of tourism, of food, etc. So similarly, charities now are in this arena of there are let's say 10 15 20 charities you know let's say we'll pick the UK for instance where they're all you know have a brand and a brand purpose and a mission and a vision and their trustees and, and their philosophy etc 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 and and their sort of governance you look down and you go through each and every single one of them they're all effectively like those corporations and those co co commercial companies and like any, any, uh, any one of us. We're all trying to sell something in terms of bidding for your attention. Yeah. So um, I, I think it is, you know, it, 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 because of the world we live in today, it, it is, uh, it's an unfair question to ask whether NGOs should be doing something like this or mm. not. On the contrary, I think you meet the world where it is uh, today and you should be creative and innovative. Otherwise, you're going to fall behind. We're going to lose our youth to others who are going to be bidding for their attention, which may not see them gain as much sadaqa or, or, or you know, charity in their lives. Yeah. We need to look at creative ways, whether it's through um, this, this Muslim Pillars uh, praying app, for example. You know, ingenious, the fact that it's so simple to use, to add as a widget on your phone, um, to save us some time for going on the internet and checking the local prayer times. Like, something like that, which is innovative, creative, you know, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we look at something, you know, w along the road w with, with AI and Islam oh, of course. coming together. I think you know? there's already a Hadith GPT or something like that. There you go. So, I mean, you know? that will open up, uh, you know, big theological questions and deep, deep questions on this. Um, but I do believe we live at a time where we need to be innovative and creative to ensure that the attraction, if you will, and also the message of what we're trying to do remains important. Uh, you, you mentioned service. You know, okay, so we need to be pragmatic and think about how the world is today. I mean, this whole debate around 100% donation policy, for example, mm. you know, it's not the first time I've heard of it. Sure, yeah. But I mean, one of the major, major leading Islamic charities in the world provides a very beautiful, succinct explanation of how actually we need to take an admin fee to ensure that your donation is getting to the right people. But thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate the conversation and all of your insights into these different issues. Um, before we go, is there any sort of uh, last words or any um, information you'd like to share with the audience, how they can connect with you, with your work, with some of the projects that you have going on, any sort of, um, you know, lo locations you want to direct them towards? So, I mean, if you want more information about the work of Ramadan 10 Project, I would say go onto our website, which is ramadan10project.com. Uh, that same uh, tagline is available on our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So you can follow us on there, Ramadan 10 Project. And also Open Aftar, which is the flagship initiative. So we have all of the information coming up on there as well. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm on Twitter. So I, I tweet uh, from time to time. Um, not so much 
uh, in, in, uh, in the past couple of months. But um, a healthy amount. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a good healthy amount. So people can find me on o underscore salha, uh, s a l h a. But I was the last thing I would say t- to everyone listening in terms of all this conversation that we, we, we've have, we've had here is we're, we're all in pursuit of something, and um, if we're not in pursuit of something, then this is the moment for us to, to pause and think about you know what is our what are we chasing, what are we what are we you know, working yeah. towards. Um, you know, we all have a, a duty, a social responsibility and social duty in this world, for sure, wherever we are on this planet. And just remember that wherever you go, where every uh, heart that you have softened is an act of charity. And, and that goes towards your, uh, your, your good deeds. And if we can think of the world in that way, that a good word can bring someone closer to goodness and a bad word can take some, someone away from goodness then just think about the thousands of words that we use on a daily basis you know how much have we have what we said made someone come closer or driven them away and same with our actions because actions do speak louder than words how much of our actions are doing the same where we're bringing people closer or further away and this is going back to our othering and belonging what are we doing to create more belonging and what are we doing that's actually impacting and influencing on othering Excellent reminder. Thank you again for being here. Uh, And to all of our listeners, we thank you for joining us here. And we will see you on the next episode of Citizen Talks.